Thousands of Israelis march in Tel Aviv and other cities after a protester sets himself on fire, angry over what he described as the injustices of the Israeli state. How deep is the socio-economic divide in Israeli society, and what are the factors driving it? Should the Israeli government review its priorities? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. Thousands of people gathered in Tel Aviv after an Israeli protester set himself on fire during a rally on Saturday night. The demonstrators were marking a year since a wave of economic protests against the high cost of living and other social issues swept the country. Moshe Silman poured flammable liquid over his body and set himself alight. Protesters held signs reading social justice for everybody and stop exploiting us. A protest leader said little has changed since hundreds of thousands marched last year and protest camps sprouted up in city centers around Israel. Those demonstrations erupted over anger with high housing costs, but quickly grew to include a wide range of social issues like high food costs and low wages. The movement prompted the government to set up a committee to provide solutions, but little change has been felt on the ground. The protests have renewed the debate over the Israeli government's budgetary priorities. Here is a breakdown of some of the public spending. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, Israel spends 16.4% of its budget on defense, compared to an OECD average of 3.8%. 12.4% goes to healthcare, slightly less than the average of 14.7%. But Israel spends more than the average OECD country on education, 16.7% compared to 13.1%. Now, Israel is made up of a number of ethnic groups. It has a population of more than 7 million. Almost 77% are Jewish, with 67% of those born in Israel, 23% born in Europe and America, almost 6% in Africa, and 4% in Asia. Around 23% of Israelis are non-Jewish. Most of them are of Palestinian origin. So just how serious then are social injustice issues in Israel today? To answer this, we're joined by our guests in West Jerusalem, Yoaz Hendel, political columnist and former director of public diplomacy at the office of the Israeli prime minister. In Tel Aviv, Akiva Eldar, chief political columnist for Haaretz newspaper. And also joining us in Tel Aviv is Hagai Matar, journalist at Plus 972 magazine, which is an online magazine covering Israel and the occupied territories. Welcome to you all. Mr. Eldar, what does, in your view, this desperate act of uh, Moshe Silman tell us about the current state of the Israeli psyche? Do you see it as being one isolated case of desperation? Or does it illustrate a wider depth of uh, current socioeconomic malaise within the Israeli society? I think that this is the, uh, this represents the kind of despair in the uh, Israeli uh, middle class, which is the pillar of the Israeli society as well as other societies in the West. The feeling that uh, we have reached a deadlock. Uh, it started exactly a year ago, and since then, uh, in the best case, uh, things uh, have not improved. In the worst case, uh, things have been deteriorating. A young couple in Israel uh, from this middle class needs around 250 uh, monthly wages in order to be able to buy an apartment. And in Israel, the uh, prices of renting apartments, especially in the center of the country, uh, where uh, uh, those people can uh, find jobs, uh, is, is something that they are not able to afford anymore. You're saying there are serious problems the government should not ignore. Do you think that this act in itself and the protests that have accompanied it will lead to some serious kind of soul searching on the part of the government? Because when we think of self-immolation, we think of the case of the Tunisian fruit vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, whose similar desperate act obviously uh, sparked a whole wave of revolutions in the regions in the region do you see any kind of parallel here or is this something the government will be able to contain very easily well the difference is that uh, still uh, those protesters um, 
believe that the Israeli democracy, the system, can still handle it. And maybe in the next elections, maybe uh, there will be early elections, but they are not looking at reforming the democratic system. They still believe that the parliament is able to do this. They will have, uh, of course, to find a way uh, to translate the uh, uh, popular protest in the streets to a political um, Let me interrupt you here if I can, to, uh, and bringing political Dr. measures. Handel, who did work uh, with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in his government. I wonder what you think the government is likely to do in this case, because to many it looks like it will simply brush or attempt to brush this problem aside, these deep grievances on the part of many, just judging by Netanyahu's reaction to uh, Moshe Silman's act of self-immolation, which he called, quote, a personal tragedy. Look, first of all, you need to understand that Israel is a strong democracy and you cannot compare Israel to other countries in this neighborhood. And especially when you see uh, that Israel is strong economically and not only on the security uh, uh, aspects. Now, secondly, I think that uh, we should separate between the protest of last year, which uh, was a prototype by um, a middle class uh, people, to the protest of uh, two nights ago, when you see a very weak uh, people, uh, poverty, and we are talking about a minority, and I think that the Israeli government will have to take care of those people. And again, this is not the middle class that we saw last year, but, and uh, but they will before we uh, talk, have to. Before we talk about the extent to which Israel is in fact a, a democracy, let's talk about the fact that this case highlights uh, the plight of someone who is not from a minority ethnic group. This isn't a so-called second-class citizen. This is someone who has lived all his life in Israel, has served in the Israeli army and and as a reservist as well, and who simply says he has not been given anything in return by the Israeli government. He's paid his dues. He could not even get rent subsidy. Is he asking for too much, or has the government simply failed him and many others like him? It's a huge strategy, but in a capitalistic uh, state, in a state like Israel, in democracy, in a free, uh, free market, when there is a competition and we encourage the competition between different companies and between different people, uh, we are not a socialist uh, state anymore. And in this uh, state, there are people that are falling down, unfortunately, and the, the, the role of the, of the government and the role of uh, the strong people in Israel is to take care of those people in a sensitive way. Unfortunately, there, always, uh, there, will, there were always people that uh, fall on the, on the way, and I think that uh, there will be people that will fall. Unfortunately, this is the reality. But why should and so I many people fall will, uh, by the wayside? Because Israel isn't cash strapped. It's not so it's, many people, by the way. Its economy is very largely subsidized by the United States. It gets uh, aid to the tune of three billion dollars a year. It's not subsidized by the United Much States. Much of the uh, budget of the state of Israel goes the into defense and into furthering the occupation and settlement building, which to a lot of people would seem like a, a big paradox for what you consider to be and claim to be a, a democracy. Well, let me first of all correct your facts. We are not subsidized by the United States. We are getting uh, a bunch of uh, money for uh, security issues, not for economic in internal uh, uh, subjects. Secondly, secondly uh, to expand the settlements, that you call it, it's part of Israel. And if you see it as a part of Israel, it's like to invest in any other part of uh, Israel. Now, th there is no connection between people that uh, get into a poverty point, people that, uh, uh, the weak people in Israel, people that cannot start the months, not even to close the months with uh, their salaries. We have those kind of people. It's it's not it's it's a tragedy, and the government should take care of the, those people and should invest money in those people. And I ho I hope that they are trying to do it. I know that they are trying to do it. Hi, Guy Matar. Are you at all satisfied by what we hear coming out of the Israeli government that this is a personal tragedy? We'll try to take care of it. When you look at um, people demonstrating on the streets, not just of Jerusalem, West Jerusalem, but uh, Tel Aviv, Haifa, Beersheba, many Israeli uh, cities. Do you feel that there is palpable anger that this government isn't helping people with basic uh, rent subsidies, with access to medical aid and so on, when it is spending billions of dollars in settling foreigners who have little or no connection to the land of Israel? Is there a paradox there or not? 
Yes, well, I, I think that um, part of the problem, you, you as was uh, talking before about the fact that, um, uh, or claiming that last year we were facing uh, a struggle or a protest by middle class people, and now what, what's happening is just a, a bunch of uh, poor people who, who have no prospects. But this is definitely not the case. I've been to the demonstrations, I've seen the people on the streets. Uh, these are not only the poor, and, and this is also a good place to, to remind viewers that one in three children in Israel is under the poverty line. So this is not an issue of a small minority. This is a part of a, a greater situation where greater and greater parts of the Israeli society are going poorer and poorer. Uh, we've just seen a research published today by the Knesset Research Institute uh, that says that 10% of the population control about 60% of the income, while 70% of the population get only 20% of the income. So there is an uh, extreme uh, measure of uh, inequality in Israel today, and I think that is the main problem. And, and besides that, Akiva Eldar, would you also consider that the Israeli government is by continually, continually highlighting the specter of the external threat, the foreign enemies, Iran, Hamas, and so on, that it is trying continually to deflect attention from the domestic issues, trying to maintain, create some kind of social cohesion and unity, despite what we are seeing now unraveling uh, and the cracks that are appearing in that uh, social economic fabric? Yeah. I think the good news about the protest is that it seems that the government, and it's not the first one, is not able to, to paralyze the uh, Israeli public by brainwashing them with, with fear. Uh, and actually there is a paradox. On one hand, uh, we keep saying how strong we are, and the other, on the other hand, we say that we are the victim and uh, we are living under existential threat. Um, so this, I think, is a sign of uh, a healthy society that uh, a normal society like everywhere else like like we see in in Greece and uh, we just mentioned you know and and I agree that we uh, sh we, we shouldn't compare this to Tunisia or to Egypt but we do we can compare this to uh, Spain Italy and Greece where uh, people are not willing just uh, to bend their heads and say, you know, whatever happens, happens, and we, we're going to live with this. And uh, I think that uh, the Israelis should wake up and ask, as you just uh, you mentioned, the, the figures of uh, more than 16% of the budget which is allocated to, to the army and to, uh, to security, um, and to ask them, well, whether this is something that we have to live with forever. Is this a natural disaster? There is nothing to do against it. Or we should uh, ask ourselves whether um, also uh, healthcare and uh, uh, proper education is part of our national strengths and uh, national interest. But, but are, and, are uh, enough if, people uh, asking these questions? Uh, people will not do, do you think there's enough pressure on the government to answer these types of questions? Is there enough pressure being brought to bear on the government uh, to, to, to make well, sure that it doesn't keep increasing well, its uh, spending just, just on defense uh, and slashing its spending on uh, public uh, expenditure? Well, uh, last year we had uh, half a million uh, people in, in Tel Aviv. And remember, we had just eight, less than eight million people in Israel. I think that this is unprecedented. And it's just the beginning of the summer. And I think that the government is aware of it. Uh, uh, you mentioned that Netanyahu has appointed a special committee to look, look into this uh, subject. They came out with uh, very important recommendations. The problem is that the government is, uh, is not doing enough to meet those uh, requirements. But uh, next year we are going to have elections, uh, maybe at the end of the year, maybe before that. And uh, no politician including Netanyahu, who is very charismatic and he looks very strong and there is not, nobody else that can challenge him right now. I think that uh, he uh, is looking into this and uh, he will have to do something if he wants to stay in power. Uh, Dr. Yoaz Hendel, do you think Netanyahu will have to do something if he wants to stay in power or can he keep uh, maintaining, some would say exaggerating the external threat to justify the priorities that the Israeli government has set itself? First of all, I agree with Akiva that uh, those, uh, those protests are very influential and the number of people that went out to the streets last year, it's, uh, 
it means something and Netanyahu was uh, worried about uh, what he will do and he thought what to do and he initiated this committee that you can say it's not uh, influence or it's not good enough but he, he, he did something because of those protests. Now, I, I think that you should uh, separate between but, but what the... what has he done uh, specifically? Because he seems to be always uh, throwing about the specter of external threats. We don't hear very much about uh, the domestic issues. Is he not deflecting attention by constantly focusing on the enemies first of, of all, First, I suggest you to hear every Sunday he has a government uh, meeting and he say a lot of things about what he is doing and what he is planning to do. So he say all the time, this is not a problem, the declaration, it's not a problem. Uh, the issue is uh, what uh, happening in the in the field, what happening in the reality, in the in uh, the internal uh, uh, society of Israel. And I think that he is doing a few steps. You can say it's not enough. I for part of the things I can agree. I'm not sitting here as a spokesman of the prime minister, but I one thing I know is that uh, in the bottom line, Israel is in a quite decent economic situation. There are people that say that uh, we are in a good uh, economic situation, especially when you compare it to Europe. There are things that we should do, there are things that uh, we need to do, uh, but still we need to do it very carefully. And I, I cannot uh, accept the, the, the calls for revolution, we are not there. And still, even those, and I agree about the numbers, that uh, we have a lot of, uh, we have more and more people that are under the uh, poverty line. Uh, still, most of the people, if you look on the polls of, uh, and you check, most of the Israelis are very satisfied from their personal situation. Well, they are very the happy Israelis, with the situation in Israel. But let me just say Israel. that not everyone is in that category of living within very decent, as you say, uh, economic uh, uh, not guidelines. Not everyone. I agree. Let, I agree. Let, let, me, let me put this to you. The average monthly salary of Arab urban employees in Israel remained the same, about a third below the national average, and hasn't changed over the last 10 years. Now you are taking me to another subject, and I agree that we should uh, uh, that we should encourage the, our population, the Israeli Arab uh, citizens, to take uh, part in the circle of walking, and this is part of another argument in Israel uh, about circles of duties and circles of rights. Uh, we have also the ultra orthodox in Israel that are not taking part in those circles, and those two populations we should take, we should uh, uh, find a way to uh, uh, mix them in the, in the Israeli society, in those uh, circles, the circle of duties and the circle of work. Haggai Matar, you're very involved, aren't you, in some of these protest movements. So you've got first-hand experience of what people within Israel are feeling across the different strata of the Israeli uh, society. What do you make with some of what uh, one of the Israeli think tanks, a nonpartisan independent organization called the Adva Center, says when it says that the occupation has greatly damaged the Israeli uh, economy with massive national spending on security compared to the unaffordable cost of rent and health? Healthcare. Do you agree with this perspective, or do you think that Israel can keep its uh, its policies going, its occupation going, despite the exorbitant uh, cost to the Israeli economy? Well, well, I think that first of all, uh, the occupation is costing um, the Israelis a lot. It's it's costing us in uh, military budgets, and it's costing us, of course, in in lives and in being occupiers. Um, but of course, it is nothing compared to the cost of the, uh, the price that the people under occupation are paying, uh, which is much, much greater. They live in much greater poverty. And you mentioned before figures about the Israeli society and poverty within Israeli society. Uh, but we have to remember that all those figures do not take into account the Palestinian population in the West Bank and Gaza Strip that are still under Israeli control control, um, yet are not calculated on, in all these figures. Um, but at the same time, as these things do cost Israel money, they also benefit. I mean, Israel does make a profit from the occupation, and the high-tech industry and the weapons industry and so many other industries do make a profit. Uh, of course, real estate, you, can, you get free land when you build in the occupied territories. So there is a great profit still within the occupation. I don't think it's something that only costs, it's also something that that benefits, uh, unfortunately, it also benefits 
the Israeli economy. And I think that one of the, the things that would uh, challenge, would be a good challenge for the Israeli society, would be to see how to, to still make a profit, but without the occupation, and how to share those profits better within society, because I think that is the main question. How to make sure that the tax, uh, that the rich pay enough taxes that go to the poor, how uh, to promote more social equality. Uh, and this will not only be by ending the occupation. It's not the only issue. Akif Eldar, what is the main issue as far as you see it? What is the main problem that the government should tackle? Because many people on the streets of Israel today talk about the cruelty of the system, the injustices, of course, but also the corruption that is endemic within the system itself. Yes, and, and this, uh, I am afraid, brings us also to the occupation because, uh, uh, you know, justice cannot stop on the border, especially as, you know, you as Hendel said that it's, uh, uh, the settlements are part of Israel. So uh, when, you, when you cross the line and you see that there is a military government there and people under occupation and you stand in the uh, checkpoints and you have to search people, you come back home and then... Uh, you change your uh, priorities, you change your, your values are, are damaged, and uh, uh, I, I think that this is part of uh, the uh, uh, corruption problem in Israel has to do uh, with the fact that we are not sensible enough. Uh, we uh, are not looking at uh, the way we should at uh, uh, human rights and civil rights and um, respect the interest and the well-being of the other. Now, um, when you have a society, well, like Haggai mentioned, that 60% uh, of the uh, Israelis um, are uh, benefiting, uh, for, uh, sorry, 10% of the uh, people in Israel are benefiting for 60% of the asset, this is part of the corruption. I think that uh, they are, there is a small group of uh, what we call tycoons, very rich people, uh, like 100 families who control this country. And the distribution, the distribution of welfare in Israel is corrupted. And uh, uh, that brings also to the uh, contacts between uh, um, the uh, uh, upper classes, the, those rich families, and the upper classes, the upper echelons in the Israeli government. And that's why uh, we, we saw a former prime minister uh, standing in trial, and he will have to uh, stand in trial again. And uh, we uh, have uh, another minister in jail. And uh, uh, I, I am afraid that uh, if we don't find a way to uh, put an end to this huge gap between rich and poor, we'll see more of that. So a lot of very serious issues then. Mr. Handel, where does the government begin? How genuine is it in tackling some of these issues, the injustices, the disparities, the corruption, leaving aside the ethical dimension of the ongoing occupation and the economic dimension as well of how much it is costing the Israeli uh, society? What should the government do? I mean, can it and should it keep spending so much money in maintaining, for example, its occupation, in building uh, its wall, in maintaining its nuclear weapons program, 200 warheads? That, that costs a lot of money, doesn't it? Israel has money. Is it spending it properly? Look, I know that there are TV stations and journalists who like to uh, blame the occupation in everything. The weather, the poverty in Egypt, the fact that people in uh, Saudi Arabia hate Israel. Everything is okay and everything is the occupation. But still, the reality is more complicated and there is no black and white. There is no connection between the occupation, as you called it, and between the fact that Israel sits and, uh, in Judea and Samaria. There is a huge debate between between you and me about uh, what is the definition of uh, Judea and Samaria. No, I, I but still, there is no connection to what happened. International to law what happened. calls it. International law calls it an oh, occupation. The okay, bottom line there is, is can occupation. Israel, occupation can Israel, is provide, not a bad word. can Israel provide for its citizens uh, while uh, it continues its economic and it, political it, policies? Israel provide provide very decent uh, uh, conditions to most of the Israeli citizens. I agree that we have a lot of things to improve in. And we have a lot of things to do, and we have to uh, to find a way to be more sensitive to the weak uh, uh, levels of the Israelis. And we have 
a lot of, uh, of uh, social justice to do in Israel, and I agree. But unfortunately, I know that this is not fit to your thesis, but uh, this is not, there is no connection between the occupation and the, the, the protest uh, one year ago, and even two nights ago, those people were, were protest against uh, what they saw as injustice without any connection to the occupation, without any connection to investment in security. And you know what, before you are taking care of uh, encouraging the, the, the free market and uh, helping the poor people in Israel, you first of all need to make sure that you survive in this neighborhood. And it's not easy, as you know, it's not easy for Arab countries, and it's especially it's not Israel, easy for Israel, which is surrounded by, by non-democratic uh, countries, non-democratic leaders who waiting for the moment to, uh, uh, that Israel will fall down. Mr. Handel, we'll leave it on, on that note. Let me thank all my guests in West Jerusalem, Yoaz Handel, in Tel Aviv, Akiva Eldar, also in Tel Aviv, Hagai Matar. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. You can send us your feedback, just email us your thoughts to insidestory at aljazeera.net. From Mirida Fakhri and the team, thanks for watching. <laughs>